Now we turn our attention to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 15, where he says, Therefore I desire that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. He had earlier in chapter 2 instructed that prayers be offered for all men and that God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And now he says that these men, men should pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. Lifting up the hands in prayer was a common ancient practice. But if you're going to pray and lift up your hands to God, those hands should be holy. Those hands should be holy in the sense that they are devoted to God. Hands speak of the idea of actions and the deeds that we do. If we're going to pray to God, then our prayer must be consistent with our actions and with our lives, and without wrath and without doubting. The Bible is consistent in this teaching that our actions, our actions toward God and our actions toward our fellow man can affect our prayers. In fact, they can negatively affect our prayers so much that God will not hear our prayer if we're not living our life in accordance with His will. And so before you lift up your hands in prayer, make sure they are hands that are devoted to the service of God, not hands that are practicing wrath and doubting. That's the instructions to the men. To the women, he says in verse 9, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly things, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. A lot of time and attention is given to this idea of modest apparel with which women are to dress themselves. The word modest just means that which is in order or decent or proper. And Paul says that women... Just as men were to have holy hands lifted up to God, women need to dress appropriately. But he says, I'm not concerned with them dressing to draw attention to themselves with braided hair, gold, or pearls, or costly clothing. But he's concerned with how they clothe their hearts. They are to clothe themselves with propriety and moderation and with good works. Men are to have holy hands. Women are to adorn themselves with good works. In both cases, the Apostle Paul or the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul is concerned with the actions and the hearts of the individuals who would come before God. We don't impress God by simply offering prayers. And we don't impress God by dressing with costly apparel or gold or pearls. God wants to see our holiness. God wants to see our godliness with good works. And that's what we should be attending ourselves to. And he adds in verse 11, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. The word silence here is the same word that was used earlier when he said that the intent of our prayers, particularly the prayers for the kings, is that we would live our lives in quietness. That's the same word here. It doesn't mean absolute silence, but it means in this quiet and humble and meek attitude with all submission. He defines what he means by submission in verse 12 when he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. The restriction of women teaching 
has to be qualified but what, by what is stated afterwards. She's not to teach over a man or to have authority over a man. The Christian woman has the obligation to teach. She has the obligation to speak the word of God. But she must do so in a position of submission, not a position of authority. Well, someone might object and say, well, why is it that way? Verses 13 and 14 explain. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. The Apostle Paul gives two reasons why women are to be in submission. The first has to do with the creation order. Adam was formed first, then Eve. The second has to do with the deception in sin. Adam was not deceived, but Eve, the first woman, was deceived and fell into transgression. And so this statement of submission is based upon those two historical biblical facts. Now it's important for us to note here that submission in any category or realm has nothing to do with inferiority or superiority. It has to do with God-given roles and God-given tasks. And because Adam was formed first, and because Adam was not deceived, but the woman was, she is to be in a position of submission. That's God's will, and that's God's way. Now, verse 15 is a difficult verse to interpret. He goes on to say, after saying that Eve was deceived and fell into transgression, He says, nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. The difficulty in this verse is, what does it mean that she will be saved in childbearing? Some have interpreted this to mean not spiritual salvation from our sins, but that her life would be spared through childbearing that though the woman bears the, uh, the result and the consequences of Eve's sin, that is, the pain and the travail of childbirth, that she would not die through that process. Well, some women have died through childbirth, and so maybe that's not the best interpretation of saved in or through childbearing. Let me give you what I think are the two best explanations of that phrase, she will be saved in childbearing. One interpretation is is that the childbearing being talked about here is the birth of the Savior. That though a woman, namely Eve, is the one who was initially deceived and fell in transgression, it was also a woman, Mary, that gave birth to, to the Messiah. And so that women have an elevated role, though women have a role of submission because of the action of Eve, they have an elevated role because of the part that God allowed Mary, the mother of the Savior, to play in the plan of salvation. And so she'll be saved in childbearing means she'll be saved in the childbearing in the the role that she, woman, has played in the plan of salvation and giving birth to the Messiah. That's one possible interpretation. Another reasonable interpretation is, is that what the apostle is saying here by inspiration is that women, rather than usurping their authority and their place of submission, will be saved in childbearing, and childbearing being a figure of speech of the God-given role. doesn't mean that a woman has to bear a child in order to be saved, but that if she will accept the God-given role that has been placed upon her. We know that later in this epistle in chapter 4, that Paul will deal with some false doctrine that said that there were some who were forbidding to marry. 
So there may have been some in Ephesus and other places who were denigrating the role of marriage and family. And Paul is here initially destroying that concept and saying that this is an honorable position. Whichever interpretation that we take, it's important to note the conclusion of this verse that it's not that childbearing, whether that's the birth of the Messiah and woman's role in that, or in her important role in the family. It's not by those actions alone that she will be saved. She must continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. You see, God is concerned with the inner man. Man is to lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. The woman is to be concerned not so much with her outward appearance, but the inner person of the heart. That she is to profess godliness with good works. That she is to continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Am I willing to submit myself to the will of God? and be the man or woman that God wants me to be.